Hey friends! So today I wanted to um, study with you a legend that is like one of my favorite legends and one of my um, the stories dearest to me that I ever encountered in my life. Um, and this is the story of Wieland the Smith. It's a legend, a Germanic legend, which Wagner took back in his Artwork of the future. It closes his essay, so he he concludes this essay on art with a sketch of I mean, like a summing up of this legend, which he's going to make a dramatic sketch of later on, which was never made into an opera. So what we're going to do today is I'm going to get into the reading of the legend. I will read you the whole legend as it is in the book and then I'm going to analyze this legend according to what I think it means for us as artists, uh, as human beings mainly and, and of course as artists. So. Um, So I'll read you the legend of rights to begin with, translated by William Ashton Ellis. Wieland the smith, out of very joy in his handiwork, forged cunning trinkets for himself, and weapons keen and fair to see. One day as he was bathing on the shore, he saw a swan maiden, come flying with her sisters through the air, and, putting off her swan apparel, plunged down into the sea. Aflame with sudden love, he rushed into the deeper waters. He wrestled with and won the wondrous woman. Love, too, broke down her pride. In tender care for one another, they lived in blissful union. A ring the swan maid gave to Wieland. This must she never let her win back from him. For greatly as she loved him, she had not lost her yearning for an ancient freedom, for wind-borne passage to her happy island home. And this ring it was that gave her strength to win her fight. So Villand wrote a goodly store of rings alike to that his swan wife gave him, and strung them on a hempen cord against her, his wall. Amongst them all she should not recognize her own. He came home once from journeying, Alak. There lay his house in ruins. His wife had flown away to father's distance. There was a king, Niding, by name who had heard much talk of Wieland's skill. He burned to trap the smith, that thenceforth he might work for him alone. He found at last a valid pretext for such a deed of violence. The vein of gold which Wieland wrote into his smitheries belonged to Niding's ground and soil. Thus Wieland's art was a robbery of the royal possessions. It was he who burst into the smithy, and now he fell upon the smith himself, bound him with chains, and bore him off. So down in Niding's court, Villon must hammer for the king all kinds of objects, useful, strong, and durable. Harness, tools, and armor, by aid of which the king might broaden out his realm. But since, for such a labor, Niding must lose the captive bonds, his care was how to leave his body free to move, yet hinder him from flight. And so he craftily bethought him of severing the sinews of poor Villon's feet for he rightly guessed that the smith had only need of hands and not of feet to do his work. Thus said he then, in all his misery, the outraged Wieland, the one-time blithesome wonder smith, crippled behind his anvil, at which he now must slave to swell his master's wealth, limping, lamed, and loathly, whenever he strove to stand erect. Who might measure all his suffering? when he thought back to his freedom, to his art, to his beloved wife, who fathomed all his grudge against this king, who had wrought him such an untold shame. From his forge he gazed above to heaven's blue, through which the swan maid once had flown to him. This air was a thrice happy realm, through which she soared in blissful freedom, the while he breathed the smithy's stench and few, all for the service of King Niding's use, a shamed and self-bound man, should he never find his wife again. Ha, since he was doomed to wretchedness forever, 
since never more should joy or solace bloom for him. If he yet might gain at least one only thing, revenge, revenge upon this knighting, who had brought him to this endless sorrow for his own base use. If it were only possible to sweep this wretch and all his brood from off the earth. She has some schemes of vengeance planned he. Day by day increased his misery, and day by day grew rancor the desperate longing for revenge. But how should he, the halting cripple, make ready for the battle that should lay his torture low? One ventures forward step, and he must fall dishonored to the ground, the plaything for his full man's scorn. Thou dearest, distant wife, had I thy wings, had I thy wings to wreak my vengeance and swing myself aloft from out this chain. Then won't itself bend down its mighty pinions above the tortured villain's breast and fan its inspiration about his thoughtful brow. From want, from terrible, all powerful want, the fettered artist learned to mold what no man's mind had yet conceived. Villain found it, found how to forge him wings. Wings whereon to mount aloft to wreak vengeance on his tormentor. Wings to soar through heaven's distance to the blessed island of his wife. He did it. He fulfilled the task that utmost want had set within him. Born on the work of his own art, he flew aloft. He rained his deadly shafts into King Niding's heart. He swung himself in blissful, daring flight athwart the winds, to where he found the loved one of his youth. And there Wagner concludes by this sentence. O soul and glorious folk, this is it, that thou thyself hast sunk. Thou art thyself this villant. Well thou thy wings, and soar on high. Cheers the legend, and now I'm going to get into the analysis. So first thing I want to say that this legend, the, the translation of Ashton Ellis is really great. It's, you know, I love the rhythm of the phrases. It's really congenial. I don't know how you uh, felt it yourself, but I, I feel like it's really, um, you, you can feel the rhythm, you know, of, it's like a poem. So I read also the original German, which is quite different, but it's also very, I, I love it because, you know, Wagner is always poetic. So, um, yeah, so apart from this, I, I really love this, this last sentence that I read because it really connects the, the reader as a human being to the legend. It makes him identify with Villand. It, he, he says here, thou art thyself this Villand. I keep losing the page. Um, thou art thyself this Villand. Well thou thy wings and soar on high. So this is a sentence I really love because it, it shows you that the legend has something to tell you. So, basing on this, we're going to get into the analysis of the, of the whole legend. Uh, I wrote down all a plan here, so I'm going to get into these lines. Um, so, to me, this legend really relates to ourselves. It relates to the human being. Why? Why? Because this, is, this legend is about our struggle as human beings, our struggle for freedom. Um, so, the, the first way that I, I realized that this legend was in fact about the human being is that when I read it, it, it always touched me. It always actually really moved me to tears almost. And I wondered why, why does this story uh, talk so deeply to, to our inner selves? And I figured it could only be because it is in fact about ourselves. I think no story can really touch us unless we relate to it and we feel that it is about ourselves. Otherwise it's, you know, just we might as well read a story about a stranger and or some beings from another galaxy and it might not even make us, you know, feel it deeply. So I think this story really um, echoes powerfully within us. 
So, um, so I, I'm saying this that it it really relates to us. But if I say this, I must have an idea that we as human beings are captive and that we want to break free from something, otherwise we're not like villains. So we are captives about something and we want to get to break free from this thing. So what are we captive of? That's, that's actually the question. Um, so this is the first question I'm going to address. So why are we as human beings captive? And I'm going to add something because I think it's very important. I think we as artists, I'm sure I'm, I'm mostly talking to dancers here. I might also be talking to you know any kind of artist interested really in, in general, in art, legends, because I know my channel is, is mostly about this and about the music of, uh, of Wagner. So I think that pretty much anyone who sees this video is an artist or at least an artist at heart. So, so yeah, what are we slaves of? To answer that question, I'm going to give you a very simple example. Um, imagine that you've been training for weeks and weeks and months and months on a ballet or, or dance step, or you've been trying to imitate a master, like visual artist at a painting, or you've been trying to play an instrument or any kind of art. And you've been doing this for days and days and you realize that even all this hard work does not allow you to reach the level that you would like to reach and to, to be like that artist. So this I think is one of the biggest ways in which we can feel fettered and we can feel, you know, unfree as, as human beings, it's through art. Imagine that you see a dancer executing a series of beautiful steps and you tell yourself, I'm going to do the same. So you put on your slippers, you go into your room and you might record yourself or just do it for yourself. And the first step you make, you feel all your muscles aching, you feel that you have no flexibility, you feel that you can't even balance in a turn, and all you wanted to express with your body, all the steps you wanted to do, as just like the dancer you saw, just, you know, you realize that you can't even do that because you are in this cell, in this jail cell that is your physical body. I think we pretty much all of us have felt that.